recording. All right, let's see. Here we are. It is Ju uh, July 12, 2016, and here we are again for CENG 3306. Um, for the first part of the lecture, we have a few uh, learning objectives. I want to de demonstrate how to calculate the stress at a point on any plane through a CAL, through a CAL member, differentiate between design and analysis, and define failure, factor of safety, allowable level, and actual level of stress, and then apply the design process. So let's do that thing I said. All right, let's get started. So let me summarize a bit first from the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we learned how to find uh, the state of stress at various rotation uh, angles in, at a point in a CAL member. So if we have a CAL member, like so, and we apply a uh, axial load to it, say the 35 kip load from before, 35 kip, 35 kip, and we have two cut planes. Oh, we could have A and B as before, or let's do CC and BB like before, I should say. CC and BB. Where phi is the angle of the cut plane from the uh, central axis. This is our angle phi. Then with the, this relationship is governed by the equation. The sigma, the uh, normal stress, is P over AT, the total area, or the tangential area of the uh, member. P over AT sine squared phi. And ta equals P over AT cosine phi sine phi. All right. In other words, axial force creates shear on different planes. So even though we have a purely axial force, we still have shear. You always have shear. Even if you have a purely axial load, we will still have shear. So just something to be aware of. Now let us discuss design versus analysis. We mentioned it briefly before yesterday, um, but I think I will actually provide a detailed write-up here, a very a more formal um, write-up. So design, what does design mean? Well, design means to create a new structure to meet a need. Means to create a new structure, new structure, to meet a need. So you start with your loads. And these can come from a variety of sources, say like the ASC 7 would be a good source for civil engineering loads or some other building code or um, et cetera. You start with the loads, and then from this, you select the uh, geometry and the material and these will meet a required standard. So you select the geometry and material to meet the required standard. Okay, so what's analysis and what, dis what differentiates it from design? Well, essentially it's the same process except you're working with something that already exists. 
um, predict behavior of, exist, of an existing stru uh, structure given standards. Predict behavior of an existing structure um, using standards. Using standards. All right. So essentially, uh, this is sort of, um, if you're familiar with the lingo, this would be, say, greenfield, and this would be brownfield. But that's but neither here nor there. In other words, here you're starting with a blank piece of paper. Think of Just think of this as starting with a blank piece of paper. Here you're starting with something that already exists, and you're just trying to decide whether it meets a required um, meets a uh, whether it's up to standard whether it's up to par and yes I say I use the word structure because that's more uh, apt for civil engineering but we could use the same we could use the same idea for any sort of engineering whether we're talking about um, whether we were talking about say mechanical engineering we could talk about machines whether a machine meets a certain standard of designing a machine we're building a new one analyzing one we're just pre we predicting whether a existing one meets a certain standard etc and we could look at any form of engineering. It doesn't have to be a machine or a structure. We could even talk about, say, like environmental engineering, whether maybe a environmental protection plan meets a certain standard, et cetera, et cetera. This applies to any type of engineering. Um, so terminology, well, I should say terminology, not, uh, not term. The terminology we use in terms of structural analysis is actual must be less than or equal to allowable. We're going to see this a lot in this course. Actual must be less than or equal to allowable. Depends on what you're looking at. This could this could mean many things. The maybe the loads are the actual loads are less than the allowable loads. Maybe the uh, stresses are, maybe the normal stress is less, the actual normal stress is less than the allowable normal stress. Maybe the, uh, maybe the actual shear stress is less than the allowable shear stress. Maybe the actual uh, strain is less than the allowable strain. Maybe the, de maybe the deflection is, the actual deflection is less than the allowable deflection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So actual. Again, this will be a guiding light as we go through our, this entire course. We're going to see actual and allowable a whole bunch in this course, and really mo most of the calculations we do going forward will be finding actuals and finding allowables. So actual, current, existing uh, load, load of Oh, we could say P delta sigma epsilon, etc. P is an axial load. Delta would be a deflection. We'll see that later in the semester. Um, sigma would be a normal stress. Uh, epsilon would be strain, etc. Allowable is the max permissible. Uh, max permissible P delta sigma epsilon etc and failure what does failure mean so we have actual we have allowable and what does failure mean well, failure does not mean a structure simply breaks in half. That is not, that's the most dramatic form of failure, but it doesn't mean, in order for something to fail, it doesn't have to collapse. That is obviously the most dramatic and noticeable form of failure, but things fail all the time without actually falling over. We're talking about, um, in engineering, th th yes, that may be a, maybe that would be a layman's definition of failure, they might, if you ask the average person, they may not say the, the they might not say a structure fails unless it collapses. That's if I go up to the average person on the street and says and say the bridge failed, they would probably think the bridge collapsed. But in terms of engineering, we do not we do not we set a higher bar. 
We don't simply say, oh, as long as the bridge doesn't collapse, it's okay. No, we have many levels of failure criteria uh, going above and beyond simply resisting the pull of gravity. Um, levels of P delta, sigma, epsilon, um, where the structure no longer performs as intended. no longer performs as intended. And that's it. So it has to perform as intended. So it's going, maybe it deflects more than, um, maybe it deflects more than, so going back to the bridge example, maybe the bridge is deflecting more than we, uh, we, we find permissible maybe we find that the um, maybe we find that the stress is beyond the elastic level the beyond the elastic limit you don't know what that means yet but, but you'll see there's there are certain stress levels that are elastic and plastic and elastic essentially means in the, in the elastic range it will um, deflection within the elastic limit will return to the original state unloaded plastic deformation is permanent but anyway you'll worry about that later um, you can have deflection out, you can have uh, loads that take you outside the elastic limit that still don't cause a structure to fail, although often that sort of loading is undesirable for a variety of reasons, which hopefully you'll have an appreciation for by the end of this course. Okay, and then finally, um, I'm going to define something you've probably heard before, but I don't know if you've ever see, actually seen it defined uh, explicitly. Factor of safety factor of safety. What does this mean? Well, the factor of safety is a scaling fa of the uh, failure level to account for uncertainty. A scaling of the failure level to account for uncertainty. Um, what do we mean by uncertainty? What can be um, what can be uncertain? Well, the real world always um, fails to behave to exact to our exact uh, desires and specifications. We can estimate something. Every every we can make a very well educated and well sound and very sound and very reasonable estimate of a load, a material strength, etc. But there is always uncertainty in the world, and you can never know anything to 100% accuracy. So there's always uncertainty in, say, material, cost, design, amount of load, uh, type of loading, and I'll talk about each of these briefly, and consequences of failure. consequences of failure. So um, let's talk about this material. Well, when we, uh, we've not talked about yield stress yet, but when you order, say, a piece of steel, when you order a steel shape, you all, when you select this shape, you also select the material that you want. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different, there's a whole variety of different types of steel that you can order. And each of them have a certain uh, material, pro have various material properties. They have certain ductility, they have certain uh, elastic stress limit, they have um, all sorts of properties that uh, you are, that you're counting on when you order that shape. But there's always a certain amount of uncertainty. What if you order 50 KSI steel? You, in other words, you order steel that uh, you believe can, ho that can, can hold a, um, a stress, an elastic stress of 50,000 pounds per square inch, but it actually only ha can only handle 48. That's an uncertainty. Now, there are all sorts of um, quality control procedures put into place to prevent that sort of thing, but no quality control procedure is going to be 100% accurate. 
Now, the greater the quality of the control that you have, the less factor of safety you're going to need, but you're always going to need something. What about cost? Well, you haven't taken construction project management yet, but when you do, you're going to learn a fair bit about estimating and designing the, or calculating the, or estimating the cost of a, stru a structure, a building, etc. Every estimate is always an estimate. It's approximate. You can use, uh, there's a variety of ways you can estimate the cost of something before you do it. Um, you can use, say, studies of similar projects. If you, ha if you work for a construction company, you can look at um, their archives and look at uh, past examples of previous projects. You can look at everything. Um, you can look at uh, many different things to determine the, to estimate the cost of a project, but it's only an estimate. If you are relying on your estimate 100%, you're going to have a bad time. In other words, imagine you do an estimate and find that you estimate that um, a building is going to cost $10.2 million to build. And your company goes and it's a stretch and they go to the bank and the bank gives them a loan, but they say, you know what? This is gonna be the absolute limit that you're ever going to be able to get for this loan. And you're going to have to, you can get that loan and you can afford the building if you max out your credit limit, if you max out the mortgage on the, uh, from the bank, if you spend every penny in your coffers, to literally max yourself out in every way that you can and um, put off paying your suppliers for, for uh, 30 days, maybe you can afford this building. You don't want to do that because what happens if it turns out the building actually costs $10.4 million to build? Then you're in trouble. Um, so you never want to push yourself exactly to the limit in cost just as well as in material. Um, design, there's always some uncertainty in design. Um, maybe you, uh, this could mean a variety of things. You could say, um, hey, maybe somebody screws up. Ideally, that's, we don't want to plan on that. That's not really what we plan for when we're talking about factors of safety. Factors of safety are more to deal with uncertainty rather than human error in terms of the design engineer. But uh, design, maybe an example of that would be um, maybe you thought it was going to be built a certain way. Maybe you designed it a certain way, but it actually got built another way. Maybe you thought, um, maybe you thought the, the soils there would be able to support a certain load and it can actually support less than that certain load. Those are sort of uh, uncertainties in design. Uh, amount of load, that's fairly obvious. Um, maybe you've designed for a uh, certain amount of wind loading and it turns out you get a really big storm that's much greater than that, etc. Um, type of loading, uh, you figure maybe you figure you're in Houston, Texas, you don't need to design for snow loading and what do you know? There's a one bad winter. There's a really freak snowstorm, and Houston gets six inches of snow. That is very fairly unlikely, but it's not impossible. Um, fairly again, fairly unlikely, but not totally impossible. And consequences of failure. Um, if you go through the IBC building code, you'll actually find that different, and, and through the ASC as well, you'll find that structures are actually categorized um, according to the consequence of their failure. So if you look at certain buildings, um, you could actually notice this in certain, just looking at buildings. So if I go driving down the road and I look at, and I drive past a hospital, one of the first things I notice is that a hosp the hospitals are always really beefy. They're always really heavy buildings. They're always, it always seems like they're massively overbuilt. And the reason for that is critical buildings like hospitals have, a, have what's known as a very high importance factor applied to their loads. You have to use, you start with the same loads that you would use for any other type of building, but you actually apply a much greater factor to those loads. You magnify them. Um, different buildings have different factors applied to them. A uh, importance factor, a, um, a single family residence, you might only have a factor of one. Um, now, you'll actually have factors of safety on top of this, but in terms of the importance factor, you might only have a factor of one, simply because, well, it will be unfortunate if one house collapses, nobody, if one house collapses, nobody wants to be in the house that collapses, but, or burns down, or whatever it is, but in terms of community-wide devastation, if one house collapses, it's not the end of the world, or if the, um, or you can have some buildings that are even less than that. For example, there are certain buildings that are very rarely ever inhabited by a human being. Um, things that come to mind are storage facilities. Um, 
up in Iowa where I grew up, we have uh, we refer, a common type of building you sometimes hear referred to as a machine shed. That's just a, a large metal building that's used to hold, say, agricultural equipment like tractors and things like that. And you might only have an importance factor of 0.8. You're actually allowed to reduce the loading, uh, reduce the loads applied to that structure in your model simply because it's very rare that somebody is going to physically be in that building um, at a at the type of peak loading. Um, all that really matters if there is a mate so the peak loading maybe that's a giant snowstorm or a huge uh, windstorm or something like that. Well, if there if that kind of amazing high load event is happening, you just don't go in the machine shed. Problem solved. And so now if it collapses, yes, it might damage some really expensive farming equipment, for example. But again, it no human life is not lost. Things are just things. Um, but things like a hospital, uh, things like a critical community infrastructure, um, you tend to see building municipal buildings like hospitals, fire stations, police stations, often even schools, um, you with very high factors of safety in terms of sorry, very high importance factors. Because if a hurricane comes through and levels the entire city, the last thing you want to fall over is the hospital. Um, schools are often overbuilt, like elementary and high schools, middle schools are often overdesigned because those are actually to, one of the ideas is that during um, devastating uh, weather events that cause a large amount of destruction, uh, destruction to surrounding property, um, what do they do? They often, uh, especially in smaller towns, the only space that is really available to house large numbers of people in emergency is the local high school gym. I mean, these are the community shelters of last resort. So they are often greatly over-designed to take this into account. So that's what we mean by consequences of failure, um, et cetera. Okay, which is why you actually also saw, um, you know, for example, the Houston Astrodome was uh, greatly over-designed. It actually served as a, it's actually served as a, um, a refuge during numerous hurricanes. But anyway, all of this still comes down to actual versus allowable. Um, actually, let me do this over here. All of this still comes down to actual is less than or equal to allowable. All this stuff is just always boils down to actual is less than or equal to allowable. So what we mean by that ultimately is, let me expand on that a little bit. The actual is less than or equal to um, failure over the factor of safety. And what this, what this means is the actual load versus the failure load, the actual deformation over the failure deformation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and this is going to be our guiding light during this course. Actual is less than or equal to failure over the factor of safety. All right. So let's do an example. Let me show you what I mean by this. Um, example one. Okay, so say we have a, a circular cross-section, um, basically a cylinder. This could be in, in a uniaxial stress test or something like that. So say we have a cylinder like this. And we're going to apply a 100 kip uh, load, 100 kip axial load, to either end of this. And we're given this, and we're also provided some other information about this. Also is given, um, let's see, it's a constant cross-section. Uh, circular. Uh, A36 steel, which means, which this means, uh, I'll, I'll just, just a second, let me, 
and the factor of safety is 1.75. So let me um, illuminate this. The A36, what this means in this case is that the yield stress sigma y is going to be 36 ksi. 36 ksi. And what we want to do is, so we're given all of this above, and we are tasked with finding find the smallest diameter to prevent failure. And again, we have to define failure. In this case, we are going to define failure as yielding. In other words, we do not want the stress to exceed the yield stress. We do not want the stress to exceed the yield stress. Uh, solution. So solution. So again, it comes down to that actual must be less than or equal to the allowable. Actual must be less than or equal to the allowable. And um, let's see, the actual in this case is going to be, uh, let's talk about stress here. Uh, so we're, we're saying actual must be less than or equal to allowable, but what we're really saying is that the sigma actual must be a less than or equal to sigma allowable. And the sigma actual must be less than or equal to sigma allowable. And the sigma actual here is going to be n over a, normal over, ac, uh, over uh, area. And the allowable is going to be uh, the sigma failure, the, the failing stress over the factor of safety. Oh, that looks bad. Let me erase that. Sigma fail over the factor of safety. And the sigma fail is simply going to be the yield stress over the factor of safety. Okay, and so that's what we're gonna work with. Now, um, so from here, I'm gonna continue down here. So N over A, so that's just algebra from here. The rest is just math. Uh, sigma Y over factor of safety leads us to um, 100 kips over pi over 4 d squared um, is less than or equal to 36 ksi over 1.75. So notice what's happening. Our factor of safety is decreasing our allowable stress. So um, let me look at that. So the um, our factor of safety is decreasing our allowable stress. So without a factor of safety, would, we would be able to take this up to 36 KSI. But we're saying, you know what? There's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, maybe this is a rather, that's actually a rather high factor of safety. So maybe this is a rather important, maybe this is a critical member in a rather important structure. So, or maybe there's a lot of uncertainty in the loads. And so we're saying that this is, uh, we're gonna have a very large factor of safety. So we're going to decrease the allowable stress on this thing. And this, if you work through the algebra, you'll find that D must be greater than or equal to 2.48 inches. Uh, however, um, in actual design, we don't usually specify things in terms of tiny, tiny fractions of an inch. Um, we always round up. So what we're gonna say is um, D is greater than 2.50 inches. Or even just 2.5 inches. I don't want to have too many uh, uh, significant figures there. And in terms of how precise you have to be, well, it's certainly a judgment call. Um, really, obviously, if you say something to five decimal places, you know you're doing something wrong. But um, in terms of what is allowed, it really depends on um, what industry you're in and what you're designing. Um, if you're working, um, you know, in uh, say uh, doing structural steel design you might your a lot of your say 
if you look at bolt sizes, hole diameters, things like that, your accuracy may really only be up to an eighth of an inch. Simply beyond that, because um, essentially every, uh, I once heard a, uh, I've heard the rule of thumb that for every extra decimal place in accuracy, or not I shouldn't say accuracy, I should actually say precision, for every decimal place of precision you add to your design, you increase the cost by a factor of 10. If you think about it, if you if you want something really really accurate, it's going it, it can be done. We have very high precision tools that can be custom custom used to you know to start doing with custom milling and really high precision type stuff. It can be done, but uh, for most things and say structural engineering, you're usually limited to an eighth of an inch. Now, if you're working for NASA, that's a different story. Um, if you're going to go down to Clear Lake and work for NASA, they um, work on a higher level of precision simply because uh, I don't know if you ever heard, uh, if you've ever looked at anything, if you ever looked at the math of the rocket equation, um, it's called the tyranny of the rocket equation for a reason. The amount of fuel you need exponentially increases with the initial mass. So if you can shave off even a tiny, tiny, if you're designing a space probe and you can shave even a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of an ounce off that space probe, well, when you, when you translate that tiny fraction of an ounce on a space probe down to the actual rocket, that comes to hundreds of pounds of saved fuel. So it's worth it. Um, they have the ability to, and, essentially, and also, um, if you're working for NASA, you're probably not buying parts off the shelf. Your, everything is essentially custom made, so you can, make, you can afford to have um, high precision things. Everything is really one off. Um, but anyway, um, usually we're not doing that, so there you go. Okay. Um, let's see. I have another example I could work through. Yeah, let me work through. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me work through this one. I just have another example. I just have, basically just have a few examples of working with factors of safety. Okay. Um, example two. So, um, say we have a W section. If you call it an I beam, I'm gonna whack you. <laughs> it's a W section. I'm gonna see that in all my student reviews. Man, this preacher is always promised is always promising to hit people. It's terrible. <laughs> okay, so my. Oh, that looks bad even for me. Um, so I'm going to have my wonderful three-dimensional drawing here. There you go. A beautiful, perfectly drawn W section. Um, well, actually, more like there. Now it's beautiful and perfectly drawn. The cut line there. Okay. So um, say we have a W section. W section stands for wide flange, if you're not aware. And down the center of it, we have an 80 kip load, uh, an 80 kip axial load. And this thing has a cross sectional area of A. Now we're given the following. We are given that the cross sectional area is 3.55 inches squared. And we're again given that it's A36 steel, which we learned means that sigma y equals 36 ksi. And um, we are asked to find, um, and we are also said, we are also told that the minimum factor of safety must be greater than or equal to 1.67. In other words, in our design. Um, or actually, this would be probably more of an this would probably be more of an analysis in the sense that this thing already exists. We're just trying to determine whether it meets our minimum factor of safety. So where might you be doing this? Well, let's say you're rehabbing a structure. Maybe you're going to do an addition to it. Maybe you're um, maybe you just bought a building and you're going to repurpose it from one use to another. Um, for example, this building we're in right now. This is a this is a Houston Community College's A. Leaf Hayes campus. And it was actually, so it's an educational institution now, but uh, it was actually built back in the 80s. 
and it was a Chevron or Shell building. I'm trying to remember, but it was a, I think it was a Chevron building. Uh, okay, one of those. Anyway, um, it was one of their laboratory buildings, and they had uh, laboratories and offices and things like that here. It's quite a, a decently large building. Um, anyway, at some point, HCC got a hold of it and turned it into a school. Well, you can bet that at some point, someone did a similar analysis to make sure the building was up to code. And uh, this um, is the kind of, and this is, maybe that wasn't impor as important for a more modern building, but let's say you really wanted to renovate a very old building, like something that was 100 years old or something. Um, you would really have to do a full structural analysis on that just to make sure it was up to standard. Otherwise, you might just have to tear down the entire thing. Um, or depending on your local codes and what's required and what you intend, etc. Or maybe just, I don't know, something like that. Um, we, could, we could talk about scenarios all day long, but regardless, we need to make sure, we need to analyze this um, member and make sure that its factor of safety is greater than or equal to 1.67. So find if um, design um, adequate based on factor of safety. based on a factor of safety approach. Okay, so same idea here. Same idea, we're gonna say solution well it's the same thing Actual must be less than or equal to allowable. And N over A um, is going to equal 80 kips, 80 kips over 3.55 inches squared equals sigma actual and this is less than or equal to sigma allowable or must be less than or equal to sigma allowable and sigma allowable is um, sigma fail over factor of safety or 36 KSI over um, the factor of safety so this translates to 80 kips over 3.55 inches squared is less than or equal to 36 uh, KSI over the factor of safety. And you will see if you do this, that the factor of safety, if you, were, if you solve this and work through the math, is less than or equal to 1.59. So the factor of safety here is less than or equal to 1.59. So this is actually not good enough. This is not adequate. This is not adequate. So we need a factor of safety of, of uh, 1.67. We only have a factor of safety of 1.59. This is not adequate. And so notice, our calculation doesn't actually indicate that this thing is going to fail. Our we're not saying this thing, if I divide 80 by uh, 3.55, I'm not going to get a stress over 36 KSI. However, this is still not adequate. We still have something beyond our allowable load simply because it, uh, it is, does not have the, the factor of safety that we need. Okay, let me work through one final example. This one involving shear. So this remember that previous example yesterday with the uh, with the two uh, shearing loads, the two P's on the edge of a gap, or on the edge of a, uh, sorry, the two P's slightly separated. Well, that's what I'm going to do here. So um, I'm going to try to draw this properly, which will be it's just always a challenge, um, which is always a gamble. Example three. Hope you don't mind my chicken scratch. Um, so here, so let's say we have two plates here and it's going to go like that. 
So two thin plates. So two thin plates like this, one here and another um, here. So you have one plate here, another plate here. And they are joined by a bolt. A bolt that comes through this that comes through both of them and has a nut here. This isn't a steel design class, we're not going to talk too much about this. Um, but suffice to say that we have a we have a load of seven kips here and a load of seven kips here. And we have a shearing force here and a shearing force here, V and V. All right, um, and we are tasked with finding, find the diameter, um, diameter using a factor of safety of 2.5. Um, using factor of safety of 2.5, and A36 steel. Um, and you haven't seen this yet, we'll just have to take on faith right now, that A36 steel has a max, tall max, a max shear stress of um, 18 KSI. You'll learn how to find that later, but uh, for now, just take that on uh, as a given. Okay. So, solution. Solution. Actual is less than or equal to allowable. And uh, seven kips over, um, well, let's see, pi d squared over four equals v over a t equals uh, ta actual um, is less than or equal to ta allowable. In other words, the shearing force is applied to the area of the pin. That's what we're trying to find. Equals ta fail, the failure shear stress over the factor of safety. Equals 18 KSI over 2.5. And so um, the, uh, let's see there. Um, solving through that, you'll get D is greater than or equal to 1.112 inches. And let's round to the, the nearest quarter inch and say that goes to D equals 1.25 inches. And what if I wanted the actual factor? So, so now I'm saying, okay, you know what? Uh, we, can't get, we can't get a bolt that precise. So let's just say the diameter is 1.25 inches. And then um, what is the actual factor of safety? We designed for a um, 2.5 factor of safety. What is the actual? Well, uh, ta, uh, if you solve through that, you will find that the actual factor of safety is 3. Point, um, um, well, actually not the actual factor. Uh, uh, yeah, the actual factor of safety is 3.16. So not bad. We actually have a much higher factor of safety than we design, than we initially estimated, simply due to the fact that we can that our um, diameters are limited into what we can choose. All right. Questions on any of this? Okay. All right. Let's keep that.